We're delighted to have Professor uh, Indranil Das Gupta from Birmingham present to us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Das Gupta is a consultant nephrologist uh, in Birmingham at the University Hospitals. Uh, he's also a professor of nephrology and hypertension at the University of Warwick in uh, UK. Uh, he's also a chair of the uh, Collaborative Research Standing Committee for the British and Irish Hypertension Society. Uh, his, uh, his research interest is, is on the topic that he's going to talk today uh, on treatment-resistant hypertension. So uh, please take it away, Indy. Thanks very much, um, Sopnil, for uh, inviting me. Um, now, uh, those who don't know the background for this, um, uh, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you and yeah, we can yeah. see the slides, yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant, thank you. So, um, so the Swapnil and I, I met over dinner at ASN last year, and we we're talking about non-adherence, and I, well, I give uh, Swapnil some examples of my non-adherent patients, and Swapnil said, why don't you come and talk to us about this? I said, yeah, that's fine, that's a good idea. And then you gave me a uh, date in summer, which I could not uh, make. And um, so this is, uh, you know, uh, why I'm here. Now, you might wonder why this unusual title. The reason being, um, although non-adherence is quite common, um, it's, you know, hypertension specialists across the world don't consider it often as a reason for uncontrolled hypertension. And even if they do, they do not always act. So and this is why I thought this is probably what it is. It's an elephant in the room that no one notices, uh, so to speak. And to substantiate that, uh, we did a uh, survey of uh, practice in the UK a few years ago uh, through the British Hypertension Society at the time. And we had a good response from 29 specialist centres. And uh, majority felt it was a major is this problem. But as you'd see, Two thirds didn't do anything about it. They didn't routinely check adherence. So, and, and I don't think it's any better now. It's probably slightly better, maybe, because there's a lot more uh, awareness of non, non adherence to antihypertensive medication. But I am, we haven't re surveyed, so I don't know, but I have a feeling it's similar everywhere in the world. Uh, these are my declaration of interest. Now, this is the agenda. Well, there's a very loose agenda. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fleet between these. So not necessarily I'll go through these in order, if that's OK. Um, can you see this uh, slide? Yeah, yeah. OK, so um, this is um, the current algorithm, treatment algorithm for uh, hypertension management in the UK. Um, and I suspect it's not much different from what you do in, in Canada, uh, except probably the target uh, blood pressure is different. So what we do now is we, we suggest that younger people and people with diabetes, they start with an ACE or ARB, then titrate up, go on to a calcium channel blocker, titrate up, then add a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic, and titrate up, and then if blood pressure is still not uh, not um, um, controlled, then consider uh, this is would be the diagnosis of resistant hypertension, and then you add um, a low dose low dose spironolactone, which is the treatment of choice since the pathway two uh, trial. Um, if blood potassium is below certain level, uh, otherwise an alpha blocker or a beta blocker. So and also seek ad expert advice. So these are the people that we see in our hypertension clinics, generally speaking. Um, and in terms of monitoring um, uh, the use clinic blood pressure, and uh, now this is something you need to take note of. It's not standardized blood pressure that is suggested in the UK. This is NICE guideline. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here, NICE and British Hypertension Society guideline. And uh, and uh, and the fact that you know we should do postural blood pressure for people who are old, older than 80 and uh, those who've got diabetes. The blood pressure target, again, we've got age um, specific targets. So those over 80, we are more lenient. Um, um, and uh, so 150, 90 and below is the target. And for uh, ABPM uh, corresponding type target uh, for both over and eight, uh, under 80 years of age. And the reason again for not uh, going a low, 
uh, lower, as in your Canadian um, guideline or American guideline of 130 or even 120, is because we are not confident that standardized blood pressure measurement will be implemented across all the clinics. So that's the reason for it. So with that background, um, and we now know what that, and you all know, I'm not, uh, um, I'm preaching the converted. Um, so blood pressure, this is the definition of um, treatment resistant hypertension, blood pressure over 140, 90 by our definition, by your definition, probably 130 over 80, despite three antihypertensives, including a diuretic and optimum doses, all of those and all optimum doses. There's another term which is not much used in the UK, but used in the US quite a lot is uh, controlled treatment resistant hypertension when the blood pressure is controlled, but with four agents. So that's the uh, other, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the definition that's often used. The reported prevalence is quite high, five to thirty percent of hi all hypertensives. And if you consider that uh, around one third, not if not one third, thirty percent of people in the world have um, have hypertension, this is a huge number of people with with uh, with apparent treatment resistance. And the main uh, problem with this is, of course, they have a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, than those who uh, have uh, non-resistant hypertension. And it's just not cardiovascular disease. It's also end-stage kidney disease. Is for, the, for us, the nephrologists, that's what would interest us. And this is based on this. I don't know if you can see um, uh, the uh, um, this slide very well. So it is based on a retrospective cohort of a large cohort of treatment-resistant hypertensives from the states. Um, um, over 60,000 um, patients uh, published in KI uh, a few years ago. And as you can see, they have compared um, from that cohort of over 60,000 different categories. So uh, resistant hypertension versus non-resistant, uh, controlled resistant versus non-resistant, uh, 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 uncontrolled resistant versus non-resistant, and then finally uh, uncontrolled versus um, uh, versus control. And you can see in whichever way you compare, there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and more specifically for our purposes, NSAID kidney disease in this huge retrospective cohort, and also mortality, except in uh, here, as you can see, mortality is also significantly increased. So this is why, uh, you know, resistant hypertension is so important to recognize and treat. Now, in terms of the causes of apparent resistance, now why I say apparent, I'll tell you in a second. Um, the, 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 the first two or three are the major causes. So white cord hypertension is pretty common. In fact, uh, we I'm not going to show you the slide. We looked at uh, what 2,000 patients who presented to the clinic with resistant hypertension over 10 years um, uh, in, in, in Birmingham, and we found over 50% had a significant degree of white coat effect. So, so much so that you would reclassify them if everyone had an ABPM. So that's white coat effect is a is a big issue. The second is non adherence. We'll talk about um, in the in the course of this uh, to, uh, this uh, presentation. A physician inertia. So patient being started on a small dose of tablet of any whichever antihypertensive and they're either not titrated up um, to the optimum dose or maximum tolerated dose or you know added another tablet another agent at a small dose and then adding on like that or not using a rational drug combination what we see quite often and i'm sure you probably do too that patient being treated with an ace inhibitor and a beta blocker which really doesn't make sense uh, so that non-rational combination could well, be a cause of uh, uncontrolled hypertension, non -resist, uh, or resistant hypertension. Non standardized blood pressure measurement, this we I alluded to earlier. Uh, the difference between standardized blood pressure measurement and uh, blood pressure measured, um, uh, you know, uh, casually or in, in the clinic, uh, the, the clinic, the routine blood pressure measurement, if you like, the difference could be uh, the median, the mean is about 14, 13 to 14 millimeters of mercury between um, between uh, the way we normally measure blood pressure and the standard blood pressure. So that's uh, something we don't take into account. Um, high salt intakes, particularly in certain uh, ethnic groups as a hugely um, raised, for example, uh, you know, uh, in the in the African Caribbean and Asian populations, especially South Asians, have a lot of salt in their diet, which often we don't consider. Um, use of concomitant medication, non-steroidals, which you all know about. The 
um, prevalence of obesity is rising and with that OSA in the population, and that often is associated with, uh, with, uh, with treatment resistance. Secondary hypertension, which is probably a very small number of patients, probably less than 1% of the resistant hypertensives. And that's something we don't need to, con do, we should consider. And when you leave all these, you know, consider all these, you actually are left with a very much smaller number of percentage of patients that actually have tr truly resistant treat, um, hypertension. So that's probably estimated between 5 to 10%, more like 5% than 10%. Uh, but even that, if you consider the total number of uh, people with hypertension in the world, is a huge number. So with that background, I'll move on to some case uh, uh, studies, which um, um, which uh, I hope will you'll find interesting. So this is a patient that a, another hypertension specialist colleague, actually quite an eminent hypertension specialist in the, in the UK, referred to me to for a uh, at the time we were doing a um, trial trial of ultrasound external ultrasound renal denervation called CONA for which ultimately we, we kind of gave up halfway through. Uh, anyway, so she, the, this lady was referred to me. She um, for consideration of uh, renal denervation because her blood pressure was uncontrolled. We're on on five or six antihypertensives at good doses. She also was uh, obese and was had OSA, um, so she was on CPAP. So she came to the clinic, and this is the lady. Uh, this is her uh, when she came to the clinic. Uh, and before I see patients or we see patients in the clinic hypertension, we always get a 24 hour blood pressure monitoring done because, as I said, you know, we find that 50 percent of them have significant white coat effects. So you could you could discharge them straight away. And um, and as you can see, she was obese, uh, OSA. She's got she had a significant uh, white coat effect, as you can see the difference between the clinic blood pressure and the mean daytime ambulatory blood pressure. And just to uh, say that this mean clinic blood pressure is standardized blood pressure. It's not not uh, routine blood pressure. And these are the uh, six antihypertensives she was on. And as you can see in good doses, you know, maximum doses almost except furosemide. Uh, so she was on furosemide and indepamide and, and losartan. So, and that, and my standard practice is to send urine off for antihypertensive drug assay, which I did. And this is what came back, you know, when I saw her a few weeks later. The no drugs detected, you know, among so all these drugs that you can see on the list. This is a. Um, can you see me? We can see you. We can yeah, see okay, that. Right. Uh, or can can see the slides rather. Yes. Um, and um, and so there's none, none in the which which was to our surprise at the time because it's 2015 and we went still. Um, um, you know, this wasn't uh, something we considered as often as we do now. And so, um, and so I, when I asked her, she said no. She she does miss her tablets once in a while, but generally she takes them. And I ignored that, of course. And I talk to her that she doesn't need to take all those tablets. She just needs to take one tablet, amlodipine five milligram, and sent her home. Uh, and gave her lifestyle advice. She never came back. Um, and I suspect her blood pressure <laughs> taking one tablet was, was was controlled now. So that's one. The second one was even more um, um, uh, in interesting. This is a 55 year old lady, an English teacher in a local school. Um, and these are her recent clinic blood pressure. She was known to have white coat effect. I can't remember what her ABPM was, but she was also obese, BMI of 41. And she was also on five antihypertensives in fairly good doses, no spironolactone as, you, as you'll see. And as per usual practice, I sent urine for antihypertensive assay. And that result came back, and there was only furosemide of the six, uh, five or six. And so before I confronted, I just asked her, so what do you do? Do you take your tablets regularly? And she said, yeah, of course, doctor, religiously I take my tablets. But I have to say there's one tablet that I, I often miss if I to take a, um, you know, if I have a lesson first thing in the morning, that's the furosemide. So that is the one that I don't take regularly, but the rest I take regularly. And as you can see, is the furosemide that was that was detected in the urine, but not the rest. The so second part of her statement was correct, but the first part wasn't. So because the uh, the thing about furosemide is it's got a long half life, and you can detect it probably even after after uh, in the urine after a week, 
and hence she probably takes furosemide from time to time, but not the rest of the tablets. But she wouldn't accept it. And when I said to her that you know, we didn't see any of her, your um, or find any of your uh, uh, blood pressure tablets in your in your urine, she just said, no, that's that's wrong. It can't be right in any way. So I didn't argue with her. I just said, well, um, yeah, if you take your tablets, your blood pressure will be controlled. She never came back again. So she probably understood. And this is a highly educated middle class woman. So, so by non-adherence, um, so I, I'm, I'm sure you you know there are lots, a few other uh, terms that are that are banded about or are are uh, used uh, in various contexts. One is compliance, uh, there is concordance, uh, there's persistence. So non-adherence is a term that encompasses both, both non-persistence, which is something uh, you know a medication taken for at least twelve months or more, and non-compliance when medication is taken. Uh, in less than 80% of days. So non-adherence is a combination of the two. And non-concordance, again, I'm, I'm sure you know, I'm just uh, trying to um, um, trying to rehash this. Um, non-concordance, on the other hand, is the, is the lack of concordance between what is prescribed and what is taken. So, um, with, so that's, that's not, and it's very common in all chronic diseases. It's just not, uh, not hypertension. And 50% of chronic diseases, you know, you will see, um, or, 50% cases in uh, patients in high, of chronic diseases don't take their tablets as prescribed. They take, you know, either take some or none. Um, but the cutoff for uh, for what is significant it varies. So, for example, in HIV treatment, 90% if they, if they don't have 90% non adherence, that's you know. Uh, taken as a serious problem, and quite rightly so. On the other hand, if they're on uh, proton pump inhibitors for uh, for um, for uh, upper GI symptoms, 60% uh, is the cutoff that's generally used by, by, by people across the world. And as for hypertension is concerned, we know that 50% of people who started on a single blood pressure medication probably stop taking it and after after a year. Now this is from um, 21 phase four clinical trials that used a single antihypertensive agent, and 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 the ones that that looked at adherence, of course, not directly in direct uh, adherence testing, and they showed that both persistence and adherence were um, 50 percent, or roughly about around 50 percent after a year. So this is just taking. Um, this is just taking one um, tablet uh, um, at a time, so rather one antihypertensive medication. This is a meta-analysis uh, published a few years ago, and that looked at um, 25 studies um, where adherence was um, was tested in hypertensive patients, and over 12,000 patients. And as you can see, 45% were non-adherent. And um, but if you consider uncontrolled hypertension, nearly 83, 84% uh, of them were um, were um, uh, non-adherent, which is uh, a huge number. And a more uh, recent uh, uh, meta-analysis, which you, some of you might be familiar with, um, showed a similar picture. So the prevalence of non-adherence in resistant hypertensive was, was 37% um, overall. But in when measured with direct method, it was much higher as 46 percent. And that kind of corresponds to two of our studies, one using um, um, a directly observed therapy and other using urine assay, showing similar um, you know, over 50 percent of uh, resistant hypertensive don't take their tablets as uh, prescribed. But it's just not hypertension, as I've said to you. E even people that are started on, you know, antihypertensive drugs, statins, antiplatelets, warfarin, etc., uh, after a after a stroke or a MI stroke on the left and MI on the right, as you can see, how it it goes down over time. So this is over what the first one. The stroke is over tw what twenty four months, and you can see over sixty percent patients were not taking their tablets. This is over ten years post MI, and again similar uh, sort of picture. So it's it's quite a quite a significant issue really in chronic disease, as I've said. And in terms of risk factors, um, younger age women, uh, number of medication they're on. Um, are often associated in case of hypertension with uh, with um, 
with non adherence and as you can see this is a study carried out by my good friend Pankaj Gupta and this is um, a, a large study of over 1200 patients between UK and and the Czech Republic in the UK uh, adherence was measured using urine assay in Czech Republic using uh, serum assay and as you can see quite consistently across the board um, you know, on the, the, the graph on the left, as you can see, this is the, the higher the number of um, medication prescribed, higher was the um, the not there was non adherence, and and these are the uh, these are all multiply uh, adjusted odds ratios, as you can see of um, of um, and again they're quite consistent between the groups. In the United Kingdom uh, cohort, there was uh, the. the uh, Diuretics were also associated independently with non adherence. And we found a similar picture in our study we did a few years ago from nine centers, 300 patients, um, uh, truly resistant hypertensives. We had uh, ruled out white coat hypertension and secondary hypertension, did urine assay, and we found that 55% uh, were non adherent, with 20% in completely non adherent. Younger age, again, uh, female gender, uh, pill burden. And calcium channel blockers in our analysis that were associated with uh, with uh, with uh, independently with um, with non adherence, and this is just to show it's just not pill burden as in non antihypertensive pill burden is it overall pill burden. So they often are comorbid and they have other medication they're on. So even the total number of medication, both the total number of medication and number of antihypertensives were independently associated with uh, with non adherence. And it's just not the number of drugs, it's the complexity of the regime. So uh, this is another study showing um, showing, um, you know, how, you know, if, if people that are on um, uh, twice daily, three or three times or four times daily drugs and, you know, the um, adherence goes down with the number of times they have to take their medication. So um, so simplification of of regime is one of the ways we, sh we need to treat. These are the tests of adherence, which I'm sure you know about indirect and direct. Um, so uh, these are often used in various studies. A patient interview is one that often used uh, pill counts, drug diary, prescription refill, more risky medication adherence scale. That's a scale that um, that is often used. Um, it's more objective than the other ones. Uh, and medication events management system, where there's a bottle caps that are, are um, are fitted with an electronic chip, so every time the bottle is open, uh, it it transmits um, to the computer. But again, that doesn't guarantee that the patient is taking the tablet. They might be flushing it down the toilet. But so it's an indirect method, and the direct methods are directly observed therapy, which we all have used in the past and still use some of in some occasions. Therapeutic drug monitoring, which is which is um, the preferred methodology in these days, and 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 in some research, electronic microchip in the tablet has been used to see if if people patients are taking it. So these are the ways of um, of measuring, and um, and as I said, urine antihypertensive assay is probably one of, is the most pragmatic and cost effective way of measuring um, uh, directly measuring adherence. And these are three different examples. These are kind of all based on um, on uh, mass spectrometry, and uh, the our, ours one was so they all kind of over time uh, they have evolved. Um, so this one we we developed ourselves in in the center, uh, and are still using it. We refined it further, and this is basically a schema of adherence testing. So you you uh, so a patient is seen in the clinic, uh, discussed. So. And and you know that's one thing. Something I every time I do a presentation on adherence testing, I must you know uh, consent. Um, how how do you go about getting consent? So it's what we have always done, and I've never had any issues with is verbal consent. Um, and similar to you know when when you are doing a, you know HIV testing on a patient, you ask them uh, similar to that. So you ask if do you do a urine? Shall we do a urine test? Do you mind? And they, I haven't had anyone saying no to me. Um, and then you, the sample is sent, prepared, sent to the uh, for analysis of the LCMS. Uh, data anal analyzed, um, returned to the to the um, to the doctor, and then that informs the consultation in the in the in the in the uh, following visit. So the benefits of urine screening, um, you know, it's a single assay that can detect multiple drugs. Our current uh, as uh, assay can detect up to four, 43 different um, drugs at the same time from a s small volume, one half a mil of urine. Um, 
So it is a fantastic advantage is the ease of use. It's, it's uh, low cost. It's probably less than 40 pounds now. It's a rapid test and you just need a very small volume of urine uh, and it's non-invasive, which is a which is a, a huge advantage. And typically the concentration of drugs and metabolites are higher in the urine than in the blood because in the, in the blood they cleared so quickly, but the metabolites stay in the urine for longer. And I'll, I'll show you uh, in a second how that happens. And sampling time is unimportant. Well, I said that, but that's not entirely true. And I'll show you in the next slide why it is not uh, may not be uh, so true, uh, or maybe the following one. So, but th there are downsides too, because it's difficult to say, where, you know, exactly when the patient took the drug, uh, whether the patient just took the drug just before coming to the clinic or in the day of the clinic. Um, doesn't tell you anything about long-term adherence. It's a snapshot. It's a cross-section analysis. It's a complex metabolism of some drugs. For example, ACE inhibitors, they don't stay in your, you can't pick it up after 24 hours, especially Ramipril is a, is a difficult one to pick up. And it's difficult to get one method suitable. So there are different uh, properties of the drugs, some positive, some negative, um, you know, um, ions. And so you know, those are the difficulties that they face. So this is looking at adherence versus drug half-life. So it is, remember that I, it, although we don't have furosemide on this graph, but furosemide is one uh, is, is similar to amlodipine. So amlodipine can be detected in the urine for up to a week, while, you know, losata and lisinopril, as I said earlier, so you, these, you know, disappear from the urine very, very quickly. So that's a, you know something to to keep in mind. And the other is it's more for the plasma, um, um, uh, well, the serum concentration is that it takes three or four drugs uh, the, the doses before it reaches a steady state in the in in the blood, and hence you may not may or may not detect it. And earlier than say four or five doses have been taken, so that's something a consideration. Am I going too fast? I'm just being conscious of the time. No, uh, no, you're on time. Yeah, we are halfway, okay. roughly at the halfway point. Yeah. Okay, fine. So I can slow down now. So this is another very interesting patient. This guy has been coming to my clinic for a long time. A 55-year-old man, blood pressure, as you can see in the clinic, generally around that. Headaches, left ventricular hypertrophy, had been attending cardiology clinic since 2011. Um, secondary hypertension was excluded. He did not tolerate ambulatory blood pressure. He took it off, uh, you know, after an hour or so. Um, he refused directly observed therapy clinic when we did that. Uh, and as you can see, he's on seven antihypertensives, yet his blood pressure was so high. So uh, when we started using the um, uh, I think we lost you there, Indy. Let's hope he can come back. He's gone completely. Let's hope he can rejoin. And we can ask uh, your question, Jan. Okay. Hi, Swapnil. I'm very sorry. My uh, laptop suddenly decided to um, to restart. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I, I, I can take it. a few questions while we're, we're waiting for, for it to restart. I can get the yeah. slides up. So, so there's a question in the uh, chat about false negatives. Are there false negatives? You know, like amlodipine can be false positive, right? Um, so I guess the short-acting drugs could be false negatives? Yes, short-acting drugs. I mean, Ramipril is one. Um, so if uh, so, what we do, our practice is if someone is on four drugs, for example, including Ramipril, and we don't pick up Ramipril, but the other three, we take it for granted that Ramipril was taken um, probably 24 hours before, 
uh, and hence um, it was not uh, not detected. So yeah, short acting drugs can be an issue. Uh, and what about the false positive, uh, false positives? No, the false. Uh, how would I think about it? Like amlodipine, right? Somebody is missing um, occasional doses. Uh, the the urine test, as far as I know, it's like a qualitative. It's present or absent. It doesn't tell you uh, anything quantitatively, does it? Well, you, it you can. I mean, I, this is exactly what I was going to show to you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Um, and if I can get it up, I'll show you again. Well, we can do quantitative tests, but generally speaking, those are much more um, labor intensive and 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 hence uh, qualitative tests are easier to to set up. Mm -hmm. And and hence most laboratories uh, do um, report qualitative tests. You're right. So either yes or plus or positive or not. But you can have a have a quantitative test, uh, LCMS test, where you can measure the concentration as well. OK, OK, that's that's really cool. And we have uh, our, our biochemist is also on the line uh, here because we have been trying to set this up. Uh, we do have a LCMS uh, and we have two now, it seems, in our lab. So so this is something we uh, hope to get it done now. Is your assay, was it all developed in house or is this kind of off the shelf that, you know, even we could go and purchase some from somewhere or is there a lot of. Uh, well, well, no, we, we, we developed it from scratch, okay. uh, but back 2015. Now, of course, there's more knowledge about it. And in fact, I was going to uh, talk about that later. But um, yes, we you can develop it if you have what the basic requirement is having LCMS mm -hmm. and interested hypertension specialist, and and uh, and a biochemist or a toxicologist who is interested in 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 developing drug um, you know um, drug measurement uh, assays. So. It is not, I don't think it's difficult, and I'm quite happy to put you in touch with Alex Lawson, who's the guy who developed this uh, with me. Uh, well, he did all the work, I took the credit. And so <laughs> he, so Alex is, is a fantastic guy, and he would be very happy to help um, um, you to develop it. And also uh, we, we, we have recently published, again, I was going to, show you that uh, in 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 hypertension a paper as to how you develop and implement uh, we published last year in january i think um then mm -hmm. I, I i can give you so that gives you a um the step by step um you know uh, how you sh one should proceed to to develop and then implement um, the um, the assay okay yeah, yeah that would be very useful because we are yeah. We are at that stage. We do have LCMS. We do have a biochemist who's really interested. Uh, and I think we do therapeutic drug monitoring for other drugs, right? Like we do tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and what have you, right? Vancomycin. So uh, we if you should do that. This is this is a doddle. This is no. a doddle. It should be pretty straightforward. It's, you, all you have to do is to validate. So uh, what you have to do is get um, um, a lot of um, different medication that you want to have to the uh, biochemist and they should be able to uh, then then uh, validate um, okay. using those. And then a few patients who are taking and uh, in a tablets and, okay. and make sure that, uh, that you can pick it up. So uh, it, it wasn't that difficult as far as I remember, but what, although I didn't do the basic work, I was just the advisor. So um, it wasn't a, a very difficult pr process. Okay. Um, while we are waiting for your laptop to restart, if there are any other questions from the audience, uh, please go ahead and uh, raise your hand uh, and we can take those questions. Oh, Brendan has a question from the conference room. Uh, thanks, a very interesting so far, and maybe you are going to get to this in, in your slides, but uh, if not, my my question is about the longer term outcomes. And so, you know, I, I think we've all had experiences where, where we've treated patients uh, who ultimately end up being non-compliant, and sometimes I'll admit to it and you get somewhere with them. Um, do you have any longer-term data on, on what happens when you find a non-compliant patient uh, who, who had previously not disclosed that to you? Uh, is it typically like the English teacher who, who takes off and you never see them again and, you, and maybe they stop seeing doctors altogether? Uh, or or do, do you have any sense as to whether we're actually helping patients by confronting them with their non-compliance? Yeah. So yeah, this is a very very good question actually because once you have um, you have um, um, you know identified non-compliance and you have um, um, uh, you know uh, advised the patient, 
and then to be fair, you, as, you, as you said quite, quite correctly, uh, you lose interests. You know, you can see your blood pressure is well controlled for the couple of clinics and you discharge them. So that's what we, in practice, what we do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to cope with this. But on the other hand, um, there are um, studies, and I'll, I'll, I was going to show you a slide on that, that showed that repeated uh, non-adherence testing does improve compliance and blood pressure management. So, um, so yes, yeah, so so that's um, um, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, you're right. But the problem is that two things. One is that uh, you need to keep at it. You have to keep measuring, probably, uh, which you don't do in practice. Um, I'm just preaching that but in practice, but. Um, but also the other thing is that you may not have the time to do uh, do that, pursue it. So if you had a clinic where you're well resourced with nurses who can, you know, keep tab on, and when the patient comes to clinic, they can talk to them. That's probably the only way to do it. Um, some sort of motivational interviewing. Um, um, so I'm, I'm, I think it's it's. Uh, let me just see if Thank I you. can bring it back up. Uh, uh, and while you're doing that, I think David, all, uh, sorry, uh, Peter had his hand up. So if you yeah. want to ask uh, your question, Peter. Please, yeah. <laughs> it was sort of related. Um, I have decided not to confront people and say you don't take your pills because I think it does just make them walk away and not come back. Um, and I, I guess I have had the practice when I suspect or some evidence before in our case it's basically from non-refills after talking to their pharmacist um i guess i tried the motivational interview of oh do you have difficulty taking your pills and discuss ways to take your pills and tell them how i take my pills and do all that kind of stuff and say oh maybe we should simplify things and just go to one or two pills not three or four because, you know, I think the two cases you've shown so far really illustrate the problem with con confrontation. Both of them fired you and yeah. uh, probably that's not a success. Well, no, I say that, um, but these patients went back to their general practitioners. So generally speaking in the UK, what would happen was the general practitioner would send the patient back if there wasn't um, I don't know if you can. Um, I'm trying to connect again. So um, generally speaking, would um, would would send them back. So when I said disappeared, uh, I didn't mean in in the sense that, 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 that they just that, 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 They didn't want to see me again. Um, um, it's just that they um, um, they. Yeah, but the first one, first case, as I said, I was uh, was referred by one of my colleagues from another hospital, and uh, so he she went back to um, his clinic essentially, and uh, and he never uh, sent her back. Um, so I can see you very well now and see if I can get my slider. Sorry about this. We are used to this. There's always something. I know. Um, you know, even after two years of the pandemic, we haven't mastered this completely. Um, sorry about this. This is frustrating. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, case 33. Yeah. So yeah, this is the, so this is a chap, as you can see, pretty difficult um, hypertension, long-term LVH, um, attending cardiology clinic. Um, so, uh, and again, so I asked him if he could do a urine test and he said, yes, of course, doctor, no problem. So I gave him, as I told him, uh, I introduced him to the nurse who gave him the uh, tube and he went to the toilet 
gave the uh, urine um, was sent off. The next morning, I had a call from my biochemist, Alex, uh, and he said to me, there's something wrong with this. And I said, what? Uh, can you see the screen? So all the tablets with medication were present, but were in very high concentration on the right. So this is the um, the quantitative test as Swapnila was talking about earlier. So you can see the 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 concentrations were extremely high, and the one most striking was the ramipril, which is ten times higher than it should be. And and I remember Alex saying to me at the time, and he said, um, um, and he said to me, um, um, this is not compatible with life. Uh, and so so and he also sent the he took a photo um, of the um, tube and sent it to, you know, uh, and, and sent it to me on, the, on my phone. And this is the target sample, urine sample that he sent me. So what he did, we suspect, was he spiked his urine. So he had, he was carrying his tablets. He went to the um, toilet and he put everything in the, uh, in the tube and shook it before sending it off. And, and these are the sort of concentrations you would see in the urine if, if he was um, adherent, but we saw the spike like that for the ramipril in particular, which was 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 uh, which kind of clinched the diagnosis, if you like. But what we did not could not explain was the fact that he had carinone, carinone, a spironolactone. You can't pick up in the urine. It's that metabolite carinone that uh, that you identify in the urine. And the carinone, how? Because unless spironolactone is metabolized you wouldn't see carinone in the urine. So that's something we could not, can, can you see me? Hello? We cannot, we can see your slides, yeah. Yeah, good. So, um, so yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so, so that's, that was the intriguing. So this is just to, to say that they, these people can go to any length to hide their, um, uh, you know, um, uh, non-adherence, uh, and and this was said uh, again. Uh, I'm sure you remember Swapnil. This is the um, this is the anecdote that I gave you um, sitting at the at the table at ASN. That these are the sort of things you you, you can expect. So that brings us to a, an important question, uh, important um, uh, sub diagnosis, if you like, which is white coat adherence. So people often take their medication. Um, you know, just leading up to a clinic visit or when they know they're going to, the urine is going to be measured. And that, again, going back to that question about repeated urine testing, this is a problem. If they know that that you are going to test the urine, they will probably start taking the tablets that they, you know, a few days before. And so so that's something to uh, to to consider. Although the, the one I described is an extreme case of this probably, it's not quite white coat adherence. It's also called toothbrush adherence. Um, so uh, so that's that. So moving on from that, we know uh, you know how important adherence is, and I mean this is from a, a meta-analysis of cardiovascular trials and and also harmful drug therapies. And you can see you know adherence improves mortality, which is hardly surprising. But what is surprising is adherence to placebo in all these cardiovascular trials also improved mortality. So adherence is a good thing, in other words. And so it's just not adhering to the medication. Adhering to placebo in trials improved mortality. And that's because, as we all know, is because they're in the dead. Uh, this is suggests good um, you know, health related behavior, probably. And hence, their mortality uh, often improve even if they're just on the placebo. In terms of factors, there are many, and there's no single solution to any of these. So, so, so your socioeconomic, you know, uh, illiteracy, poor socioeconomic status, they can't afford their cost of drugs, uh, relationship between clinician and patient, um, the lack of knowledge and training for healthcare providers, very importantly, inadequate time for consultation, especially in primary care. That's a, that's a big problem, even in secondary care. I think we haven't got time to go sit down and talk to them. So what you do is we've got a pharmacist in the in the clinic who has got the time to, to, to discuss things with them. So all my difficult uh, 
patient with non adherence I, I refer to her and she sees in, in her in her list and she has the time to sit down and talk to um, condition list uh, lack of symptoms like hypertension that's one reason why they they often stop because they don't feel any any uh, more unwell than normal and also there's no immediate consequences they don't see complex treatment regime duration of treatment we've talked about uh, and then um, you know, very importantly for the patient related factors, you know, patient's knowledge of the disease and, and acceptance of monitoring. So, so patient's health behavior and beliefs are very important. And so I, I'm not asking you to look at, I mean, I read all this, you know, it's, it's the, so there's a different solution for each of these issues. So hence there is not no single bullet, if you like, to, to, um, to for this uh, condition. Uh, this is just to say how it is very expensive. You know, a, a study done about 15, 13 years ago now that showed that the cost of um, wasted antihypertensive medication to the NHS was 100 million pounds in 2010. And I bet it's it's double now. So this is the amount of wastage and, and cost to the to the to the health service um, that we expect um, and wherever that might be. And so how to deal with, and these are kind of general principles of management, which you alluded to, and you know, uh, one of you um, spoke about earlier. So it's just trying to explore the reason of non-adherence, um, risks and consequences to be explained, how they manage their drugs, uh, complicated drug dosing should be made simpler. Um, and I, what I often do is to negotiate a reduction in the number of drugs uh, and aim for a more realistic higher blood pressure target. So if they're on two or three different drugs, I say we'll take one at a full dose and we'll accept a higher blood pressure. That's still better. And of course, lifestyle advice. So, so in other words, you know, there's some general principles which I'm sure we all observe, but the problem with that is the time that, that, uh, that uh, we don't have. The second is motivational interviewing, which I've talked about and has been shown in an RCT and uh, which is a quite well conducted RCT and a meta analysis, which is a bit underpowered uh, or seven, a bit, bit biased um, uh, uh, meta analysis that showed that there's significant improvement in, in systolic blood pressure with improvement in adherence uh, with um, motivational interviewing. But again, the, 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 the uh, downside is, is it takes a lot of time to implement in clinical practice. What uh, I find quite useful, and although I find useful, but it's not something we can practice in the UK simply because um, there are not many combination drugs. I know this is something that has been shown and proven to be um, to be um, uh, helpful in people with non-adherence. Uh, so fixed drug combinations or two or three drugs. And, and um, this is from a analysis from quite a few years ago. So there's nothing, no new knowledge here, but that's something to consider. Uh, um, and the other thing that's been found to be of benefit is empowerment, asking them to monitor their blood pressure. And this is done by uh, Richard McManus, who's, who is a um, primary care physician interested in hypertension and a lot of work on in this area. And he showed quite, you know, this in this Tasmin, Tasman 4 trial in the UK that self-monitoring improves blood pressure control with or without um, telemonitoring. So this is, if you look at this line here, uh, self-monitoring baseline at six months and at 12 months is a significant improvement in blood pressure control over 12 months when you ask the patients to, um, to, come to, uh, to take their blood pressure themselves compared to, um, compared to uh, the usual, um, uh, you know, uh, management group. So that's uh, another way of um, of dealing with this. And again, going back to that two country um, try, study that uh, my friend uh, Pankaj Gupta did, and again he showed that, uh, and I've alluded to this already, that by you know repeated biochemical screening does improve um, non-adherence. And as you can see here, um, so it's the UK and Czech Republic, and so. At first appointment, second and third appointment, uh, systolic blood pressure progressively improved, as did um, the number of drugs detect, you know, detected in the urine and, and for here and also the Czech Republic. So, um, so repeated um, screening um, may improve, but the, uh, the proviso is, of course, the white goat adherence you need to consider. 
And I'll finish with the fourth case study, which is slightly different form of non-adherence. This is a 70 year old man, retired engineer, um, um, you know, uh, well off, uh, well educated, uh, referred from another center for renal denervation to us. Um, he had persistent high blood pressure on mu with multiple antihypertensive drug intolerance. And you can see the list, it's a, it's a long list. Almost every single thing has been tried and, and he had side effects. Now this guy is a, is a very meticulous chap being an engineer. So he kept, uh, kept a diary of his, his blood pressure done regularly, you know, two readings in the morning, two in the evening for a long, long time. And also, you know, everything and took photo of every time he had a side effect. And he would send us the photos and I've just compiled them. So he had angioedema um, with every single drug. And you can see there are at least eight drugs mentioned here. And um, so he would, he would take a photo and send to us and that's when we compile them. So he had engineered with every single drug, which we could never understand what, how that can happen. How can a person get, um, uh, you know, um, same uh, side effect from all medication, but whatever he did. So he was sent, as I said, for renal denervation. So this is another problem that we don't, I'm sure you all see quite a lot of as well, but we see quite commonly in middle-aged women. And, and is find it very difficult. And I often refer to my pharma pharmacist colleague uh, to deal with this. So what we do is we rule out white coat hypertension and secondary form of hypertension uh, to start with. And then uh, we try drugs that haven't been tried. For example, alpha methyl dopa, which is not used very rarely these days. You often use that or clonidin or uh, and things like that. Uh, and if that doesn't work, they still get side effects. We then try drugs that have been used before, but not for angioedema, of course, for other side effects. And we would use the smallest dose to start with and then gradually increase to see if that sometimes helps. Um, we um, have, we don't use ourselves, but some another center in the UK who uh, have, a, um, have a clinic dealing with this, they use clonidine dermal patch, which is only uh, available in Germany. So they used to get these um, patches from um, Germany and use, and they found, um, you know, they to be quite useful. And the other is, I think, is is a, a for, for device therapy. I mean, uh, and that's the, that's probably the way forward with these people. And uh, you know, the innovation is coming back uh, certainly, and that's something to consider for these people. Going back to my patient, this as I said, he, he kept meticulous diary. And he sent, he gave me this, um, this um, uh, graph of this blood pressure and, and what had happened. So this is over two years, as you can see. So he was referred to us with that sort of blood pressure. These are home readings for renal denervation. But when he did a uh, renal angiogram, we found that he had critical stenosis on the right and non-critical stenosis of renal artery on the left. So we did a right renal artery stent, waited for a couple of months no improvement or very little improvement in blood pressure. So we decided to do a, a stent the other side and then uh, renal denervate both, uh, both kidneys, which we did. And again, a couple of months, no improvement. Then he came back to clinic here to see me and his blood pressure was much better. And as you can see, he was started on a PDE5 inhibitor for, for impotence and his blood pressure improved. And then, uh, then we said, that's fine. Then if you're going to carry on, uh, wait, I'll see you again in, in six months. He came back after six months. He had stopped it and his blood pressure was up. And then he was given PD, another PDE5 um, inhibitor, Tadalafil, and his blood pressure once again improved and month 24. So this is just to illustrate that there are unusual treatment that we don't often don't consider for these people with multiple antihypertensive intolerance. And the thing also that I'm sure you all know that PDE5 inhibitors were developed initially as antihypertensives, not, not to treat erectile dysfunction. And that in this case, you know, is a fantastic illustration of how, how, how it can help uh, blood pressure, you know, in people that have multiple antihypertensive intolerance. So this is what I've said to you. This is a summary uh, that 50% of patients have apparent uh, treatment resistant hypertension, high risk, a uh, huge cost to the NHS. Urine drug assay is a reliable way of detecting um, non-adherence. 
Many factors responsible to unknowing single solution, discuss frankly, explore reasons, explain risks, negotiate reduction in medication, which I find quite useful and higher blood pressure goal. Uh, intervention to improve adherence, motivational interviewing, repeated urine testing, single pill combination. Self blood pressure monitoring empowers patients and health control in the same way as it does uh, improve diabetes control and may consider telehealth interventions and which I didn't say much about and device therapy, I think is the other option when we have a reliable device therapy. This is what I was going to talk to you about, but I don't think that it will take another uh, whole uh, lecture. This is what I was uh, alluding to. They are um, a paper we wrote on behalf of the European Hypertension Society, Hypertension last year, um, where we discuss how to develop and implement chemical adherence testing. Um, so um, yeah, I'll leave it and leave you with this and, um, and any questions um, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Indy. That was really wonderful. Uh, we will definitely be looking at this paper. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the chat, there was a question which I think you alluded to about patient values, right? Like why are patients non-adherent? Uh, yes. and you talked about uh, that briefly. Um, is that something that uh, uh, you discuss uh, with patients or, or, you know, what is part of that motivational interviewing uh, uh, that your pharmacist does? Yes, yes, yes. I, I think that's what it is. They're exploring exactly what the issues are. And, and you know, you will find there are people that are not intentionally non-adherent. They don't take because, say, for example, a young person with, with, a, with, with, a, with a full time job and, and, and young family. They just don't forget to take it. I had a patient the uh, day before yesterday who said, and she, he's, a, he's a postman who does our evening shift. He comes back, so he's been given medication. So he's all his medication are twice a day. I don't know why. Um, Ramipril twice a day, amlodipine twice a day, etc. And his blood pressure is never controlled. And, and his wife tells me that he comes home at 11 o'clock in the evening, he has his dinner, and then goes to bed and often forgets to take his tablets. So uh, we simplified and said, so if I hadn't had that conversation, the wife hadn't come, I would have never found out that. And so I said, well, then why you can take all your tablets in one go. You don't need to split them. So I, I'm hoping when he comes back, you know, this is last week. And when he comes back, his blood pressure will improve because uh, because that was the reason. It's not that he didn't want to take tablets. It's because the circumstances didn't 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 allow him. Um, Exactly. Yeah, vibes are very important in history. Uh, uh, so, oh, Maya, yes. you had a question. Uh, thank you. Hi, Dr. Rudis Gupta. I'm one of the uh, nephrology residents in Ottawa. Um, I think Dr. Hermes kind of asked this, a similar question. So, I guess for me, um, you know, going over when you were going over the cases, I kind of find it a bit sad that patients have to like trick us to think that they're adherent because at the end of the day, who's losing? They, they're the ones that are actually losing. This is their life. They're making these decisions and this is really going to impact them. And I really like what Dr. You know, Magner had mentioned, which is, you know, like you want to do your best to not lose them, right? Because at the end of the day, that's kind of what we, and I know with those limitations of our work and we won't be winning every battle. But um, I guess to summarize what the evidence you showed is what, what I understand is that motivational, um, you know, discussion, and that as well as empowering patients facing the pill burden are ways are evidence-based ways that have shown yeah, it, patients mm. who may not be fully adherent no you, you're yeah. right but again i mean this might not um work for everyone because there's so many different reasons why and that we, we that we, we we listed in that uh, bmj article is that there's so many different reasons, you know, you uh, have to um, find a reason because, for example, someone who's who can't afford their prescription, what do you do? How do you help them? You know, um, can you can you help them to get a, a waiver on their prescription charges? And that might help uh, someone who's, as I said, like this bus driver, you know, we, we need to see if, or, 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 you know, he hasn't got the time to um, or he forgets to take his tablets. So there are different reasons, but these are kind of what I've suggested are general principles but they may work for some may not work for the others so it's a difficult one I, I know all said and done this is a difficult problem to deal with and the fact that we don't often and at least in in the uk we don't 
you know, once we get their blood pressure under control, and after identifying their non-adherence and solving it, we discharge them. And what you, we don't know what they're going to do when they go go back to the to primary care, and uh, unless uh, unless we follow them up, which is not possible to follow them up forever, um, because the numbers are are big. You know, if fifty percent of resident hypertensives are non-adherent, that's a huge number of people that we're talking about. Exactly right. Um, there was a question in the chat, uh, which I think uh, our biochemist answered. But um, I, what I would like to ask you is, do you look at non-adherence in the dialysis population? Because, you know, non-adherence is not just restricted to hypertension. I'm sure it's there everywhere else. Uh, and the question there was, you know, if, if you've got an aneuric patient, do you check it in the blood uh, rather than the urine? Uh, and I think uh, our biochemist said it's it's pretty easy to do it in the blood, except for the fact what you alluded to is that the half-lives make it tricky uh, to check it in the blood, unlike in the urine. Yeah, now we do we do occasionally people that still have some residual kidney function, but the problem is you don't know how much of that is um, being excreted. Um, so we have done, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, done urine on uh, on uh, because we don't have a bladder, we don't do a blood assay. So urine we have done and and for, and um, many a time we we didn't find any. Any, any drug in the urine. But, you know, but, and, and, and as you said, non adherence is extremely common in dialysis patients and kidney patients in general because of polypharmacy, you know, huge amount of it's, I'm sure you have the same numbers. You know, you've got patients on 10, 12 drugs, different things they're taking, including phosphate binders and sodium bicarbonate and stuff like that. And how do you expect them to take all the tablets? Absolutely. Peter. Yeah. Yeah, Peter. Um, I wondered why you were measuring the uh, ACE inhibitors rather than their metabolite. Why ramipril rather than ramiprilat, which has a longer half-life? Well, um, a difficult question for me to answer. We, yeah, I, I think we, we when I said uh, an ACE inhibitor, we did mean the metabolite as well. So uh, whether it's not the parent compound, it's even the metabolites, they don't last very long because uh, of the uh, short half-life. Yeah. Indeed. Um, they don't last very long. And this is ramipril is supposed to be a longer acting. You know, if you're talking about captopril, it's it, uh, almost sadly, will, most of the times you'll miss it. So, you know, we're talking about metabolites as well as okay, the parent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I assume so. Yeah. yeah. But perindopril, for example, or trandolapril, they should still be picked up. Am I right? Well, yes, but ACE inhibitors in general are, are, are shorter acting, shorter half life, and hence, yeah. um, you know, uh, are less likely to be detected in after 24 hour, 48 hours. So yeah. uh, the, the thing is, you know, for a lot of pinofurosemide, even if they hadn't taken it for a couple of days or three days, you still will detect it. That is not to say that they have taken it or they take it regularly. That just tells you that they have taken it in the last three days or last week. Right, right. Fantastic. Thank, thanks again, Indy, for that uh, brilliant uh, discussion. And we loved all those cases. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, be inspired to set it up. Uh, and yes. I think from the discussion, it looks like we might be able to do it. I might get uh, the contacts for uh, for your yeah. biochemist for for Alex. Absolutely, Lock. we could we Later. could set up a meeting, and Alex, I'm sure will 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 help you develop it. Fantastic, thank you okay. again. Uh, hope to see right. you. Thanks very much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Talking to you. Bye bye. And sorry about the uh, the the technical issue. No, no, it all worked out. <laughs> okay, great. See you soon.